Have you ever wondered how that small bird can sit on the powerful electric wires as if there were nothing substantial being carried along those lines? And yet, power lines kill balloonists every year. We don't want you to be one of them. Our special report tonight comes from the ballooning community. The hazard of power lines is generally accepted as ballooning's greatest danger. Balloon pilots agree that the one situation which caused them the most concern when learning to fly was the possibility of hitting power lines. Let's go live to our on-the-scene reporter, Chuck Clark, at the balloon rally. Thanks, Carolyn. Well, as you can see, it's a beautiful day out here today, and there's a lot of balloon pilots and balloons getting ready to fly. Early this morning, we talked to several of them about what their greatest fears were when they first were learning how to fly. I'd say that power lines are my biggest fear, that and landings. Flying in town is really scary. What is it about flying in town? Well, there's an awful lot of power lines, and when you're flying over power lines, it makes your landings really tight. Like you said, tight landings can increase the chances of hitting power lines. As a matter of fact, the thought of striking power lines still frightens me and I've logged a lot of hours. Landing in tree line fields, sometimes you just can't see the power lines hidden in the trees until it's too late. Well, Carolyn, this is a theme I've heard over and over again today. Power lines cause a lot of concerns to pilots. Chuck, it appears those pilots' fears are well founded. Statistics show that accidents in ballooning are caused primarily by power line strikes, hard landings, and equipment failure. Power line contacts account for only one-third of all ballooning accidents. However, they represent almost two-thirds of all ballooning fatalities. I'm sure you'll be surprised to learn exactly how these power line strikes cause death. Chuck, out in the field, has been asking just that question. Let's see what he's discovered. How do people die when they contact power lines? Electrocution. People die when electricity is conducted into the basket. Not just from the basket. Sometimes people come into contact with lines themselves directly and are electrocuted. They have a heart attack and die. Or a crew member rushes up to help and grabs the basket. That completes the electrical circuit. And more than one person can be electrocuted like that. It sounds to me like electrocution is the big danger. Back to you, Carolyn and Clark. The common response from these pilots is that electrocutions cause death from balloon power line strikes. Actually, this is a misconception. The National Transportation Safety Board reports that few deaths have occurred from electrocution. Statistics indicate that electricity and electrocution are not the primary threat. A fatal accident that occurred in Albuquerque, New Mexico, illustrates the actual number one threat, namely falls. In this instant, the basket was separated from the envelope and fell to the ground below, killing all the occupants. In power line strikes, deaths and injuries are about 90% from falls perhaps 10% from fire, and less than 1% from electrocution. Note that most falls over 30 feet are fatal. Wait a minute. What do you mean that most falls over 30 feet are fatal? Dr. Tom McConnell, a renowned expert on balloon accidents, has studied the statistics of falls and can answer that question. Pathologists at the New Mexico Office of the Medical Investigator divide injuries into three categories based on fall distance. Falls of 10 to 15 feet result in orthopedic injuries such as sprains, strains, and breaks. Falls of 15 to 30 feet result in neurosurgical injuries of the head, neck, skull, and brain. Falls over 30 feet typically result in death. This is relevant because most power lines vary in height from 25 to 150 feet. The second major threat is fire. Contact with power lines can rupture the fuel tanks or the fuel lines which could spread propane around the area. A subsequent ignition from a spark or some other source actually causes the fire. People are burned to death as a result. If all balloon pilots are so aware and concerned about power line strikes, why do they occur so often? Let's see what Chuck has found out about the reasons. Thanks, Clark. Maybe these pilots can tell us exactly why a balloon would strike a power line. Well, distractions might be one reason. Things like crew talking on the radio, or passengers asking a lot of questions, or even beautiful scenery. 
distractions can just make it a lot harder to pay attention to flying the balloon. Sometimes the power lines are placed very far apart and the lines between them have no markers on them, making it difficult or impossible to see them until it's too late. Also, a gust of wind can catch you by surprise and push you into the nearby lines. And high winds can cause a lot of problems, especially with landings. And there's always a possibility of downdrafts, wind shears, and thermals to be worried about. Lots of times you can get caught in something like that before you even know it and get blown into power lines. Well, a lot of things can go wrong with flying a balloon because there are a lot of things that affect balloon performance. An old porous balloon is not going to fly as well as a new tight balloon. Also, a lot of weight in the basket, the balloon is not going to perform as well. Fuel pressure is directly related to burner efficiency and also balloon performance. Hot outside temperature, the balloon is going to be sluggish. And if the pilot is not 100%, he's not going to be able to react to a given situation as quickly as he would like. Believe it or not, sometimes the quality of light or the angle of the sun can be a problem. An early morning flight, for example, sometimes the glare can temporarily blind you. Or when you're landing in the evening, sometimes the ground gets a little dark to see those lines. And sometimes those lines are covered with foliage. Some pilots I know, they get so fixed on the target, they might not see an approaching power line. <laughs> or it could be as simple as bad vision. Wow, I never realized so many things could go wrong. How do you avoid these hazards? Well, pilots have to stay on top of things. They can't let their attention wander. Training, training, and more training. Consider all the possibilities. Think safety. Make safety the number one concern. I think pilots and our crew need to participate in education and safety awareness programs. We need to be as well informed as possible about power line safety. Power lines are dangerous, but how much does the average balloon pilot know about electricity and the electrical system? Our interviews indicated that many would like to know more. Hi, I'm Reddy Kilowatt. I've been representing the power companies for about 65 years. I'm here to introduce the fundamentals of electricity. First, let's look at some basic terms you're probably aware of. Most of you are familiar with DC and AC, but do you know what they mean? DC, or direct current, flows in only one direction. AC, on the other hand, is alternating current and reverses direction many times each second. Most of the world's power systems use AC power. Fundamentally, there are three terms you should understand. Voltage is the potential or force of an electrical circuit or source. This potential is what causes current to flow and is measured in volts. In electrical distribution systems, the common measure is kilovolts, meaning 1,000 volts. Current is the actual flow of electricity through a conductor. The unit of measure is amperes, or amps. The amps are what kill you. In an AC circuit, frequency is the rate at which the voltage changes direction. This oscillation is measured in hertz formerly known as cycles per second. Remember the difference between electrical current and electrical voltage. Current is the rate at which electricity flows, and voltage is the force that causes it to flow. Think of it this way. Volts push, current flows. In the United States, the frequency of power generation is 60 hertz, with voltages usually between 22 kilovolts and 26 kilovolts. It is interesting to note that 60 cycles per second is almost exactly the time the heart takes to depolarize and repolarize, which is why stoppage of the heart is the main cause of death from electrocution. Okay, great. So what's important here? The power delivered through a power line is a function of both current and voltage. The same power can be delivered using either low voltage and high current, or a high voltage and low current. Because minimizing the current flow minimizes any energy loss on a power line. The combination of high voltage, low current is usually used in power lines. This is unfortunate for balloonists because extremely high voltages can be encountered in most power lines. This is important because given enough voltage, anything can become a conductor. Look at this example of a cable hanging over a high voltage line and in contact with the ground. Initially, the power line is dead. Watch what happens when the line is energized. Imagine this is your balloon with the basket on the ground and the envelope draped over the wires. Trust me, many parts of your balloon make equally good conductors, like a pyrometer cable, load tapes, and ground line, even special material suspension cables, just about everything. And I hope you noticed the intense flash. In case you missed it, let's take another look.
Did you anticipate it would have caused such a strong effect? The risk here, in addition to electrocution, is severe burns. The point is this. What may be more efficient for power companies, namely high voltage, low current, is certainly more hazardous to balloonists. Whether you're the pilot or a crew member, you can benefit a great deal from understanding the basic elements of an electrical system so that you can recognize some of the things you see as you navigate the countryside. Greetings! People call me Power Bullet, and I'm possessed with a passion for power systems. Let me share with you why I get so excited about it. There are three parts to any electrical system. Generation, transmission, and distribution. Electricity is generated in power plants. You'll know these plants by the turbines and the large power plant structures. High voltage transmission lines take the electricity cross country. These are the large hummers that we frequently see. Electricity is distributed locally to substations, which then bring power to you and your community. From the ballooning perspective, the transmission and distribution systems utilize wires which represent the threat. Let's examine the transmission system. The transmission system deals with the long distance power transmission from the power plant to a concentrated usage area such as a city. Generally, high voltage wires have potential from 132 kilovolts for short distances to 175 kilovolts and even 735 kilovolts for longer distances. Transmission poles are very high, perhaps as high as 150 feet, more than twice the height of a typical balloon. In general, long-distance systems operate with taller poles and use larger diameter cables than the shorter distribution system. The diameter of conductor cables in transmission lines are usually between 1 inch and 2 and a half inches. Pretty big, wouldn't you say? Is there any question in your mind which would break first? the balloon suspension cable or the power line cable. Have you ever noticed the single wire running along the top of the transmission structures? If you haven't, it's one that deserves special attention. This neutral line, also known as the ground line, is for protection against lightning strikes and is especially hard to see. And why do you care about a neutral wire? Let's look at two likely scenarios. Scenario number one, you snag the neutral line, travel along it, and abrade your suspension cables, severing the basket, and the basket falls. Remember the number one threat? Falls. Scenario number two, you snag the line, slide down into hot wires, causing current to flow through the system that can result in propane fires. Remember the number two threat? fire. Now let's check out the distribution system. It connects the transmission system with the consumer at the other end. Transmission lines come into a substation where the voltage is reduced and connected to the distribution system. Most U.S. residential houses have a 220 volt drop that connects the house to the local distribution system. Distribution poles vary from a range of 30 feet tall to 75 feet tall, roughly as tall as a balloon. Power line system support structures come with a variety of types, towers and poles of wood, metal, and concrete. The type, color, and size of these structures may vary because the power line supports are much easier to see than the wires the balloon pilot must be observant for all variations much to the pilot's dismay some power companies are attempting to make power lines less visually obtrusive by painting the support structures to blend in with the background foliage or landscape of course, camouflage can have disastrous consequences because it makes power lines even more difficult to see. 
In this case, what's more pleasing to the eye may not be good for balloon safety. All transmission and distribution lines are protected by devices that interrupt power in the event of a serious fault or break in the system. The power company utilizes two different protection methods, the circuit switcher and the circuit breaker, both of which interrupt electrical power. For example, if the wind blows a balloon into a power line causing a short, the protection device would trip and the line would become de-energized. Circuit switchers are power line protection devices commonly found in transmission substations on the high voltage side of the step-down transformers. In the event of a fault, the circuit switcher opens and remains open. Once it's open, for any reason, it will remain open and the voltage threat of the power line is gone. Remember that the transmission system uses very high voltage that would be reduced to lower voltages for distribution. The lower voltage distribution system is protected by circuit breakers. Unfortunately, for balloonists caught in power lines, many circuit breakers automatically reset because many faults in the field are momentary faults. Rather than disrupt a large portion of the service area that could cause a blackout, the circuit breaker assumes that the fault will last only a short amount of time and therefore will automatically reset to restore power to the area. For a balloon sitting in these wires, the circuit may open, thus de-energizing the line, perhaps multiple times before locking in the open or safe position. This switching occurs at about a half second or second interval. Be prepared for a de-energized line to become active again, because it will. The reset can go from only a fraction of a second up to a minute or more. Let's summarize what we've discussed about the electrical system. The transmission system is comprised of long distance high voltage wires running from power generation plants to concentrated power usage areas. Potentials of 132 kilovolts up to 735 kilovolts exist. Using very tall poles up to 150 feet high with large diameter cables. Safety, circuit switchers that open and remain in the safe position in the event of a fault. The distribution system is comprised of shorter distance medium voltage wires, serves the local consumer, potentials between 12.5 kilovolts and 138 kilovolts with 220 volts at the residence uses smaller poles between 30 and 75 feet high with smaller diameter cables. Safety, circuit breakers that automatically reset at varying rates and over different periods of time. Be prepared for a de-energized line to become active again. That wraps up our section on the electrical power system. We all agree that power lines are dangerous to balloonists. Salutations. Let me introduce myself. My friends call me Captain Quad. I'm here to share some of my hard-earned wisdom about pilot decision-making and power lines. Our concern about power lines begins with launch. Let me give you our first rule of thumb. For a safe launch, to clear a 100-foot obstacle at conservative rates of climb, allow 100 feet of horizontal separation for each knot of wind speed. Keep in mind, a knot is one nautical mile per hour, about 1.15 miles per hour. Sounds pretty good, but let's take a hard look at what this really means. Consider this scenario. The wind is blowing at about five knots. Using the rule of thumb, you're 500 feet upwind of a power line that's 100 feet tall. If 
500 feet looks like a long distance, but is it really safe under these circumstances? By the way, you should step off 500 feet sometime so you have a good visual feel for the distance. 500 feet is about 170 yards, or one and two-thirds football fields. Let's assume the balloon rises at a conservative 100 feet per minute. Will the balloon clear the power lines or not? We'll answer this in two different steps. Step one, time to reach altitude equals the desired altitude divided by the rate of climb. To clear the obstacle, our desired altitude is at least 100 feet. Therefore, our time to reach this altitude is one minute. Step two, now we'll calculate how far we've traveled in the one minute. Horizontal distance equals the wind speed multiplied by the time. Wind speed is given in knots, which is nautical miles per hour. One nautical mile is about 6,000 feet. Therefore, one knot is equivalent to 6,000 feet per hour or 100 feet per minute. Our five knot wind will result in 500 feet horizontal travel in the one minute it takes to reach altitude. Therefore, any rate of climb exceeding 100 feet per minute will safely clear the obstacle. And we have verified our first rule of thumb. Once safely launched, we need to consider the hazards in flight. That brings us to our second rule of thumb. Cross power lines in level flight are with a positive rate of climb. Remember, you cannot always see the lines. If you see power poles, maintain your altitude above the level of the tops of the poles. Unless there is absolutely no wind, you are usually safe directly above a power line. The most dangerous area is upwind from the line. The question is, how far upwind does this danger exist? Basically, it's a function of wind speed and descent rate. When the wind speed and descent rate combine in such a way as to result in a possible power line strike, we say the balloon is in a power line danger zone. As an example, assume you're in a balloon at 1,000 feet AGL, the legal altitude for flying over congested areas, and you're descending at a rate of 200 feet per minute. How far ahead is the power line danger? For a five knot wind, a balloon in a 200 foot per minute descent from 1,000 feet AGL is in danger of striking power lines located approximately one half mile downwind from the balloon. Danger zones are usually out ahead of us and not directly below us. We tend to think a lot about power lines when we're crossing over them. That's when we tend to think we're in the danger zone. As you've just seen, we're in the danger zone far before that. We've just been working with potential power line danger zones. Now, let's consider how to react and what decisions to make when a power line strike is imminent. If you are going to hit a power line, there are things you can do to make this situation safer than you might initially think. What I'm saying is to train yourself to react in the safest manner possible. Since you don't practice power line strikes, you're going to have to create an automatic response to the situation when you first realize you're in the danger zone. Let's examine two possible outcomes of a power line strike. Outcome one, contacting power lines below the envelope's equator is very hazardous because the balloon is forced upward and the envelope drags the gondola over the wires. This will frequently result in burning or abrading through the cables. If contact is made at or below the equator, there's a good chance of a fuel tank or fuel line rupture from power line arcing. Neither of these consequences is acceptable. Outcome two, contacting power lines above the equator is much less hazardous because the balloon will be forced to the ground by a combination of the obstruction and wind. Knowing that contact with the power line must occur in a precise way in order to minimize personal injury is a big part of the pilot's decision-making process. The decision involves whether to rip or to burn. This brings us to our third rule of thumb. When in doubt, rip it out. Instinctively, all pilots want to burn because if we can fly over the wires and miss them completely, 
There are no complications. The problem is this. Can you absolutely predict that you can absolutely clear the power line? Do you think that this pilot should have taken different action? When you can't absolutely predict that you can absolutely clear the power line, rapid deflation is a safer decision. Therefore, rip it out. Look at the impact of ripping it out when you're at the power line level, which can be anywhere between 30 and 125 feet. It will mean a very hard landing. If properly prepared for a hard landing, there's little chance of fatal injury. Don't forget, whenever possible, turn off the pilot light and close the fuel tank valves before striking the lines. Ripping at the power line up is an unnatural thing to do. It requires that you be properly trained to react quickly. It may mean a very hard landing. And it's still your best option. Let's recap our two possible decisions, ripping and burning. Power line contact while burning is likely to be at the basket or skirt level. Think about it. It's right where the people and fuel are. Pretty dangerous and scary. On the other hand, power line contact while ripping is likely to be above the equator, is away from people and fuel. It's much less dangerous. I'm saying that the decision to rip is a safer decision. However, there are some problems with ripping. The pilot's ego could be severely wounded, and there is a possibility of criticism for overreacting. Envelope damage could be extensive, but insurance companies would much rather pay for a damaged envelope than the death of a passenger. The landing may produce collateral ground damage, and there is some chance of injury to yourself or your passengers, but it is likely to be non-fatal. The major factor to minimizing death or serious injury is good decision making. The critical decision to rip or burn must be made quickly and without hesitation. The time available is determined mainly by the wind speed. Our first rule of thumb dealt with launch situations and safe distance from the power line. Now we're in flight and the situation is slightly different, leading to our fourth rule of thumb. The critical distance for decision making decreases as wind speed increases. The critical distance is influenced by two variables in addition to wind speed. One, the time it takes to make a decision, from the point the pilot senses danger to the point of decision and action, typically is about five seconds. Two, the time it takes the balloon to react. This varies with each balloon and conditions. Typically, this will be several seconds. Remember, our balloon travels at 100 feet per minute for every knot of wind speed. Therefore, at 10 knots, we will travel 15 feet every second, and the effect on critical distance is clear. Making the decision which avoids the power lines is far better than having to make a decision on the best way to contact them. Why wait until the last few seconds to make that critical decision? While wind speeds and rate of descent were presented in the danger zones discussion, they're not the only parameters we should be concerned about. Let's investigate more thoroughly two parameters introduced in the previous section. Balloon position relative to a power line and rate of climb. This figure shows a variety of scenarios for a balloon approaching power lines. In each case, the balloon is upwind of the lines and is either ascending in level flight or descending. The power lines are either above eye level, at eye level, or below eye level. These combinations present a matrix of nine scenarios for your consideration. Balloon position is represented here in rows. It's the parameter we most frequently think of when we're dealing with power lines. Row 1 presents scenarios where the balloon or basket is below the lines, so the wires are clearly above our eye level. Row 2 presents wires at eye level. That means the basket is essentially level with the lines. Row 3 presents a comfortable situation. Wires are below the eye level and the basket is above the wires that you're crossing over. Rate of climb is in columns. Think about it. While this is often secondary in our thinking, 
it is arguably more important than the actual position of the balloon. Column 1 presents an ascending balloon. Column 2 presents the state of equilibrium, or level flying. Column 3 presents a descending balloon. This chart represents an excellent opportunity to explore what you might consider the most serious, the most difficult situation to deal with, and allows you to consider which scenario is the most likely to result in an accident. Different people will have different views about the relative dangers of these scenarios. In general, a descending balloon is in a vulnerable position because the air in the balloon is cool and it takes a lot of time to overcome the downward momentum to get the balloon turned around. Remember the second rule of thumb. Cross power lines in level flight or with a positive rate of climb. The value of these scenarios is to take a detailed look at each of the nine situations and study the possible risks of each, even the ones that initially appear to be safe. Take a good look at these nine scenarios. Imagine you're in each of these situations. Which one causes you the most stress? Which seems the safest? Hi, I'm the crew chief for this balloon, and the crew calls me Super Chief. My job is to fill you in on what to do when the balloon has already struck the power line. A knowledgeable crew chief and crew are essential once a strike has occurred. No matter how much you understand about power lines and how to avoid them, you could still find yourself involved in a power line accident. Proper planning and training can make a difference in the outcome of such an encounter, not just for the pilot, but for the crew and passengers as well. We begin by discussing a hugely important and yet little known hazard of the power line strike, step voltage. By this time, you're real clear that a balloon contacting both the power line and the ground is considered energized. Remember our video on what happened at high voltages? In these conditions, assume that everything is a conductor. The high voltages are enough to force electrical current through most materials. Even though we might think of our suspension cables as being insulators, in the presence of high voltages, they can bring that electricity directly into the basket. A balloon or chase truck in the area can be energized in more than one way. The obvious example is draping the envelope over a power line. But what about the balloon envelope or basket laying on top of a downed power line? Or a truck running over a downed power line? Count two more examples of ways to become energized. Plus, if a power line should fall on your truck, that would also cause it to be energized. The hazard we call step voltage surrounds energized objects. Let me handle this one, Super Chief. I'm an expert on step voltage. When voltage comes into contact with the ground, whether from a down power line or an energized balloon, it spreads out in concentric circles along the ground. The effect is similar to throwing a rock into water, causing ripples to spread out from the rock. These circles or rings are tightest, smallest, and most powerful closest to the basket or rock, and they become larger and farther apart as they move away from the source. The energy dissipates the farther away it moves from the source. These rings have different voltages. Most balloonists don't realize this. Think about what that means if different parts of your body touch different voltage rings. These voltage differences could cause you serious harm. Let's look at the effect of step voltage when leaving the basket and what to do to exit and clear the basket as safely as possible. Initially, when leaving an energized basket, make sure to jump completely clear of the basket and avoid touching any part of the balloon system and the ground at the same time. If any part of your body touches the balloon, you'll complete the electrical circuit and become the conductor to the ground. You will be instantly injured, maybe even killed. When your feet touch the ground, make sure that you have both feet close together and that you do not fall, causing your hands to touch the ground or the balloon. If you land in a wide stance or your hands touch the ground, you could be straddling two different rings and cause serious injury. The voltage in the rings will decrease the further you get from the basket. So once you land on the ground with both feet together, think carefully about how you will move away from the basket. Want to walk or run? Don't. The best way to put distance between yourself and the basket is by either hopping with both feet together or shuffling. If you shuffle, keep both feet close together, touching the ground at the same time and taking small steps. Again, if your stance is wide, you chance straddling different voltage rings and getting zapped. Continue hopping or shuffling until you're a good 20 yards from the basket. 
In wet weather or on wet ground, that distance should be doubled. This is a move you should practice as part of your safety training for yourself and your crew. It's not easy, and it's certainly not instinctual. It would be a shame to do this for the first time under the pressures of survival. The jump from the basket is tricky. It's easy to fall, and in this case, falling could cause you to straddle different voltage rings. Also, your instinct is usually to run away from the basket, not hop or shuffle. Remember that there's no going back if you make the wrong move. Wow, that guy's fast. In and out before you even know he was around. We've discovered the hazards of step voltage and energized systems. We've learned how to exit the basket and work safely away from it. But we can't have people just running all over the place. Let's take a closer look at who's responsible for what at the scene of a power line strike. Here's our first scenario. The balloon is still inflated, but it's touching the power lines or is dangerously close to them. This is the least serious of the three scenarios, but it can provide a false sense of security. It will be very tempting to have the crew just pull the balloon away from the power lines. Do you know pilots that have reacted this way? Have you done it yourself? Do not do this! Remember step voltage and energized systems. Don't let your crew or passengers complete the electrical circuit and die. Instead, here's what you do. Designate the crew member with the most experience to communicate with you and the crew. It may not be your crew chief. By selecting a crew contact, you can then deal with only one person and can concentrate on lessening the chaos. Have your crew contact walk around the balloon at a safe distance in order to assess the situation and advise you. Until the situation is assessed, do not let anyone near the balloon. Remember, no one should approach the balloon without the pilot's permission. No one should touch the basket. If the envelope contacts energized lines with the crew holding on to the balloon, their bodies will complete the electrical circuit to the ground and serious injury or death can occur. Remember that circuit breakers re-energize after contact, so be prepared for a de-energized line to become active again. If your balloon is touching the power lines, get your crew contact to identify the balloon's location, including the direction from the closest marked intersection, street address, or number on the power pole closest to the balloon. Have the crew member call the local power company and give them this information. Do you know the number of your local power company? If not, call 911. Bottom line, do not come close to the basket or touch any part of the balloon if the balloon is touching power lines. The crew should only attempt to move the balloon if there is no chance that the balloon will contact the power lines or unless power company personnel instruct them to do so. Here's the second scenario. The envelope is draped over the power lines and the basket is either suspended in midair or is resting on the ground. Again, remember that the circuit breaker may cause the line to re-energize at any time. Whenever any part of the balloon comes in contact with lines, always assume the line is energized and every part of the balloon is a conductor. Metal parts such as the pyrometer cable are excellent conductors. Even balloon fabric can be a conductor when in contact with the high voltages typically found in power lines. As with the first scenario, do not let anyone near the balloon. In this situation, here's what you do. Again, designate your crew contact. Quickly, but carefully assess the situation with the help of your crew contact and check out the balloon. Look for propane leaks, smoke, sparks, or flames. Check for injuries to yourself or your passengers. Calm the passengers, even if you don't feel calm, and give them instructions in a clear, even voice. Inform the passengers of what has happened. Tell them not to touch anything and to stand as far away from the power lines and balloon parts as possible. Tell your crew contact to take charge of these things. Instruct everyone to stay far away from the balloon. Park at least 100 feet away. Keep all non-essential people away. Check for downed power lines. If you find any, don't let anyone get closer than 50 feet from the balloon. As with the first scenario, designate a crew member to identify the balloon's specific location. Instruct the crew member to call 911 or another emergency number, as well as to contact the local power company with pertinent information. If you don't have a cell phone and the chase vehicle has to leave the site to find a phone, Make sure a first aid kit, drinking water, and fire extinguishers are left at the site. Instruct all other crew members to control the crowd until authorities take over. 
Keep in mind that a crowd gathers quickly and gets larger over time. Also, assigning crew to assist with crowd control gives them something to do. Crew members, here's what you do. Remain calm and keep your composure. Doing the right thing slowly is better than doing the wrong thing quickly. Make sure you listen to the pilot and or the crew contact or crew chief and follow their instructions. Do not endanger yourself or others in any way. The situation is already bad enough. Don't add to it by careless action. Once emergency personnel have arrived, brief them with relevant factual information, especially particular dangers. Follow their instructions and offer to help them. Again, remember that some emergency personnel, especially in rural areas, may be unfamiliar with balloons and power line accidents. Know your CPR and first aid. Exit the basket only after someone from the power company assures you that the power has been turned off. Unless there is a life-threatening situation, do not exit the basket. But if you have to, jump if the basket is close enough to the ground to exit without injury. Remember, falls over 30 feet are usually fatal, and 8 to 10 feet may cause injury. Did the people involved in this situation have any alternatives? If you are too high to jump safely, deploy a drop line well short of the ground. Warn people on the ground not to touch the drop line. Use this technique only if you are in imminent danger by staying in the basket. Make sure the drop line has been secured with slack in the basket so that it can be lengthened if the balloon shifts up. Use gloves when descending the line. Go down slowly. Drop clear of the line. Do not let your feet hit the ground with your hands still on the drop line. This is a very serious situation with no easy solution. Do you see any problems with this proposed action? Bottom line, do not help anyone exit the basket. Do not touch the basket and the ground at the same time. Once the power is off and help has arrived, have the crew assist in passenger and balloon recovery. Okay, here's the third scenario. The basket crashes to the ground after contacting the lines. This is the most serious power line accident. The basket may be separated from the envelope because the power lines severed the suspension cables. The most common problem is that the pilot and passengers may be unconscious or incoherent, and there may be major structural damage to the balloon. The basket could be on fire. What happens if the pilot is incapacitated? Then it's up to Super Chief to take over. If I'm not on your crew, and let's face it, you might not have a super chief like me on your crew, then the responsibility falls to the crew member with the most experience. So, crew expert, take command and do the following. If the balloon is clear of the power lines, check first for electrical wires that may have broken and be touching the ground. If wires are touching the ground, stay at least 50 feet away from the balloon and the wires. If the pilot is able to hear you, advise the pilot and passengers of the danger. If wires are not touching the ground and are a sufficient distance from the balloon, approach the basket to assess injuries and administer first aid if needed. If any occupant of the gondola is unconscious or incoherent, don't move anything or anyone unless necessary to prevent further injury. If there is a fire, attempt to extinguish it only after making good and sure that there is no electrical danger. If possible, assign someone the task of taking notes of the activities and making diagrams of the scene. The NTSB will want to know. This is especially important if people or things are moved. Bottom line, see if the pilot is unconscious or incapacitated. If so, the crew chief takes over to secure the situation. That includes all actions stated in our second scenario. That means your crew and crew chief must be in the know about what actions to take. Hmm, a lot to remember. I wonder how many of you have prepared your crew for such power line encounters. Hadn't thought about it? Well, now's a good time. Bring your crew together and develop an emergency action plan for power line strikes, including necessary actions like those we've discussed in our three power line strike scenarios. Spend some time and emphasize the importance of knowing what to do and how to react if they see you headed for the power lines, and worse yet, if you strike one. Good planning also includes practicing this action plan with your crew. As with practicing the jump from the energized basket, wrong actions can have devastating effects. What should you include in the plan? Try these ideas. Review the different types of power line strikes and the different reactions required by each. 
write down the sequential steps of the emergency action plan and make them available to all crew members. Don't just talk about them. In a crisis situation, do you think your crew will be thinking clearly? Give them something to fall back on. Laminate a card containing the sequential steps on the front and what to do and not to do on the back. Put the card in a conspicuous place in all chase vehicles. Include important emergency phone numbers, especially the power company. Include blank spaces for temporary locations like out-of-town rallies. Review your card often. Making a laminated power line safety information card and stowing it in designated locations ensures that you don't have to remember all the facts and can have them at your fingertips when you need them most. Make sure you tell the crew where to find the card and the importance of being familiar with the information it contains. Well, that about wraps it up for me. As we've discovered, there's a lot to know about what to do in a power line strike situation. You just can't be too well prepared. Of course, my desire for you is that you never have to use this information. But what if you do? Will you be prepared? Let me introduce myself. I'm J.D. Huss. I represent FAA Flight Standards. I'm here today to remind you of the requirements of the National Transportation Safety Board and their reporting policies. All of these policies are spelled out in NTSB Part 830 of your FAR AIM manual. Who can tell me the correct classification for a power line strike? Is it an accident or an incident? I hope you know the difference between the two, but just to be on the safe side and not to make any assumptions about it, let's investigate this subject. For this discussion, an accident is an occurrence which takes place between the time any person boards a balloon to fly and the time everyone departs the balloon, in which any person suffers death or serious injury or the balloon receives substantial damage. On the other hand, an incident is an occurrence other than an accident which affects or could affect the safety of operations. Based on these definitions, I'll ask that question again. Would you classify a power line strike as an accident or an incident? If you said accident right off the bat, think again. The answer really is, that depends. There are many things to consider before you can realistically answer that question. Did anyone on board die? Does their death have to be instantaneous or can it occur later and still be considered an accident? Did anyone on board suffer serious injury? What is considered a serious injury? Did the balloon receive substantial damage? What is considered substantial damage? If the balloon strikes a power line after landing, can it still be considered an accident? Let's look at these questions and see if we can really determine an answer to the accident incident question. The first four items deal with people. Death. You might think that's obvious, but what about a death that occurs due to injuries later on? Fatal injuries are defined by the NTSB as any injury which results in death within 30 days of the accident. Well, that's pretty clear. If no one dies within 30 days of the accident, then you wouldn't consider the event to be an accident from that standpoint. Next thing, serious injury. The NTSB considers serious injury to be any injury which, one, requires hospitalization for more than 48 hours within seven days from the date of injury. Two, results in a fracture of any bone except simple fractures of fingers, toes, or nose. Three, causes severe hemorrhages, nerve, muscle, or tendon damage. Four, involves any internal organ, or five, involves second degree burns or third degree burns or any burn that affects more than 5% of the body surface. Okay, I can hear you now. That's a lot of stuff to remember. But these conditions must be present for the event to be considered an accident 
due to serious injury, and you must be aware of them. Let's look at the balloon system and what is meant by substantial damage. The NTSB considers it to be damage or failure which adversely affects the structural strength, performance, or flight characteristics of the aircraft, and which would normally require major repair or replacement. From the balloon perspective, general problems would be broken load tapes, broken skids, or damaged uprights or burners. To be sure about your system, consult your manufacturer's continued airworthiness manual. Finally, although it was listed first in the accident definition, did the strike occur before or after the flight ended? Had the pilot lights and burners been turned off? Had the top been pulled? These are important distinctions. To adequately answer the accident incident question, the general answer still is, that depends. It depends on your specific circumstance. You need to be aware of the conditions constituting an accident and then determine whether these conditions have been met. Even though something may seem serious enough to be considered an accident to you, don't jump to conclusions. Even if you're sure your event was an accident, never initially report it to the NTSB as one. Always report it as an occurrence unless someone has died. It's easy to get an incident upgraded to an accident, but it is not easy to downgrade an accident to an incident. In either case, the NTSB requires specific information about your accident or incident. Where would you go to find this information? Just remember, the NTSB section is in part 830 of your FAR AIM handbook. Now that you know about accidents and incidents, let's consider the reporting. Keep in mind that reporting is not the same as notifying. You as the PIC must notify the NTSB immediately and by the most expedient manner possible. Notifying is making that initial call. After the dust is settled, then you file your report, but only if it's requested by the NTSB. Otherwise, no report is required. Where do you file this report? At in the NTSB field office nearest the accident or incident site. These field offices are located in a dozen major cities throughout the United States. Contact your local FISDO, such as here, for assistance. Now that you know how to handle an accident as far as the NTSB is concerned, I hope I'll never have to meet you on the way to the NTSB office. Remember that all this information is in your FAR AIM handbook in NTSB Part 830. Pilots and crew need to read it over and become familiar with it. You never know when this information might come in handy. We've covered a bunch of material for you today, and we're getting ready to wrap it up. But before we do, here are a few pointers for you so your flights will be safe and enjoyable. When launching, take notice of any power lines in or near your launch area. Be aware of how much lift you'll need to safely clear the power lines. Remember our first rule of thumb. Allow for a minimum of 100 feet of horizontal distance for each knot of wind speed. Avoid making high wind inflations with power lines downwind. While flying, when approaching power lines, remember our second rule of thumb. Make sure that your rate of ascent is sufficient to clear the power lines or that you are in level flight above them. Have everyone on board maintain a constant vigil for power lines and other obstacles all around the balloon. Always assume there will be power lines in the vicinity of roads. When landing, do not land near power lines. 
try not to land upwind in front of power lines. Due to angles of the sun, power lines may not be visible. Look for power poles or other structures that may be supporting power lines. If a power line strike is imminent, remember our third rule of thumb. When in doubt, rip it out. Turn off the pilot light and close the fuel tank valves before striking the line. If you're in the power lines, remain in the center of the basket and away from anything metallic. Do not attempt to remove the balloon from the power lines. If fire or another emergency necessitates that you abandon the basket, jump clear of the basket without making simultaneous contact with the ground. Chuck Clark joins us in studio tonight with a wrap-up of our special report. Thanks, Carolyn. This has been quite an education, and I think those pilots and crew now have a better understanding about how to avoid uh, power line strikes, or if involved in one, how to respond to the situation. Our audience got a great appreciation for electricity and the electrical power system. Uh, they learned how the power line danger zones, all about them, and the decision-making that must occur as you approach power lines under different conditions. Developing a sense of pilot and crew responsibilities, keeping the crew informed and involved, has to be a big safety key. And I like those laminated cards. I thought they were great. <laughs> like I said earlier, there's always been a lot, there's been a lot of information presented. I think I have a way to help you remember the important pieces. It's all summed up in the word prepared. The first letter, P, stands for plan. Develop an emergency plan and go over it often. Keep copies of the plan readily available. R stands for readiness. Realize what to do and knowing who should do it are critical to a positive outcome of a power line strike. E, emergency. A power line strike is an emergency. In an emergency, everyone must know their roles. P, practice. Practice exiting the basket. Practice pilot and crew emergency responses. Practice flying in the safest manner. A stands for accidents. Remember that power line accidents account for more than two-thirds of serious injury and death in ballooning. R, rip or burn. Know the consequences of each. Far fewer fatalities occur when a pilot rips out. So when in doubt, rip it out. E stands for energized. If any material is touching a power line, the balloon is potentially energ energized and therefore a conductor of electricity. And finally, D, Decision-making. The causes of most power line accidents are from a lack of awareness or poor pilot decision-making. Remember, prepared. Chuck, that about says it all. Thank you for joining us for this special report on balloon safety. This is Carolyn Grantham. Good night and safe flying. <laughs>